If you can't keep your eyes on the screen for a while, listen to a podcast on the go, in your car, at the supermarket, while waiting for your coffee to be ready, or taking your dog for a walk. If you look at the biggest amount of wealth destruction has happened in the so-called environmentally, uh, you know, uh, faced companies. If you look at a company called Susalon, for example, or Mozabair, these were the two largest companies which were there, uh, you know, focusing on solar and wind for the past decade, and they went bust. <laughs> Folks, welcome and thank you for joining us on this episode of the Ideas Project, a limited series by Small Case. I'm your host, Anupam Gupta, and today we are joined by Arvind Kothari, the founder of Nivesh I. Arvind has over 12 years of experience in equity research and investment advisory and had started his career as an industry research analyst at ICICI Bank. He's also well-versed with the wealth management industry, making him the perfect guest to talk to us about ESG and green energy. How important are these non-financial factors of environmental, social and governance for investors nowadays? How do applying these to your process of analysis help in identifying material risks and growth opportunities? What are these growth opportunities in this sector? Stay tuned till after the break to find out. And welcome back, Arvind. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for doing this for our listeners. So, Arvind, the world is undergoing this major energy transition Currently, talk to us about this transition and how it affects India in the near future. You know, are we expecting a boom to be in, in this space thanks to this transition? So, the transition is very evident post COVID. Even before COVID, there were a lot of steps uh, specifically taken by the Eurozone. But what has happened post COVID, most of these countries around the world they've made targets around where they want to go net zero emissions, right? And if you look at the investments that are happening in most of the, uh, you know, spaces, where, whether it's solar, whether it's, uh, you know, nuclear, whether it's uh, wind energy, there is a clear shift that people are talking about and also implementing. It's the first time when we are seeing funds taking action in terms of categorizing the investments, whether there is an ESG compliant, uh, you know, uh, investment happening or not. And the resultant effect is that if you look at the whole, uh, uh, you know, solar space is experiencing a growth of 20-25% per annum, which is almost zero for non, uh, you know, uh, the fossil fuel industry. And uh, the overall uh, installed capacity in the world has gone up from just 230 gigawatts to around 850 gigawatts last year and is expected to go to around 2800 to 3000 gigawatts by 2030. Within the scheme of things, if you look at India, surprisingly, we have been able to achieve our goals also, where our you know, Prime Minister told that we are going to achieve 100 gigawatts of, uh, you can say, uh, solar energy uh, way back in 2013-14. It was uh, completely unbelievable because we were just 2.5 gigawatts then, but we've gone almost 20x and now we are at 60 gigawatts. And our plan in India is to go to around 300 gigawatts by 2030. And that is something which is in a way looking uh, reasonably achievable because corporates like Reliance have pledged that they'll invest around 6 lakh crores in various projects uh, uh, from green hydrogen to solar energy. And if you look at, there has been a lot of shift towards a government policy in terms of you know, also PLI, which they've announced, they'll be spending around 50 to 60,000 crores mm. for these kind of initiatives, which will enable, you know, a lot of manufacturing of solar panels in India, a lot of uh, green hydrogen in India. If you look at uh, policies like uh, even uh, encouraging, uh, you know, uh, first of its kind, uh, uh, you can say hybrid energy uh, plants in India. So... What is happening is that India in a way is becoming center stage to just not manufacture solar equipments for our own country, but also to export because the whole world is telling about, you know, China plus one as a strategy. And if you look at the solar eco chain, everything is being manufactured by China. We are just assembling, right? So if solar panels are getting manufactured more in India, solar cells are getting manufactured more in India, we will also become an export hub. And that is where uh, European nations are already in touch with a lot of corporates in India, which we are, uh, you know, experiencing uh, that they will be tying up with them to uh, source their material requirements. So the shift is very much there and it is now on ground visible. 
and the coming years would prove uh, whether this uh, is sustainable or not but right now every aspect that we are looking at is hinting towards that it's a large change that the world is seeing after many many years mm. and there have been mandates by european investment banks uh, where they will uh, not be financing any uh, you know fossil projects for that matter and there's a there's a very big uh you can say in uh, uh interest cost uh now which would be uh, you know applicable to projects which are you know fossil fuel projects and for esg projects there is a very big rebate you can say or they are getting uh, money at a cheaper cost uh, because of these funds which are chasing these assets equity or debt both instruments are being funded at a very low cost for the esg projects and non esg projects are facing the brunt because of you know high cost of financing mm. so nice comprehensive answer there arvin two questions here esg and investments what's the esg impact on investments is it something that does esg actually affect the value of an investment and you know how does esg actually create business value let's look at this from an investor's angle yeah so that's a very important question because we are not here for charity right the world only believes in ideas which are profitable at the end and we've seen a lot of mishaps also in this whole esg uh, you know bandwagon where there are lot of uh, you can say uh, uh, things which are being done just for the sake of esg and which actually is not contributing any value to the world but if you think from a perspective that uh, esg basically is telling you sustainability should come via the whole environmental standpoint the social standpoint and also the governance standpoint which improves the longevity of any business so if you think about valuation in in stock markets when we value any company it is the pe multiple that we assign to it right so what is the price earning multiple which basically is you know the number of times value that i am giving to one years you know earnings mm. that definitely would be given more to companies which are esg compliant because the risks in the business are less right because if the government is you know thinking that the business is environmentally compliant it will not you know harass that business more if it is socially compliant then the communities would support it it will get workforce which is you know uh, uh, talented and they will enjoy the work environment and also the impact on the you know governance end would make sure that there are no corporate frauds mm. so that will increase the p multiple that i assign to a company which is you know esg compliant and hence like to like if two companies are going for an ipo or maybe listed in the markets if both have 100 crores of pool of profit one would be maybe valued at 20000 crores and the other would be valued at only maybe 500 crores or 1000 crores because of non esg compliance its sustainability is a question mark so that is a very big differentiator in how valuations or wealth creation is happening for promoters who are running these companies right yeah in terms of sales for example right so a lot of these esg compliant companies are re- recording higher sales than non esg compliant companies because even customers these days for example in textiles if you're re- re- using a recycled fiber for example levi's did an ad that your jeans is made of polyester bottles right so what it is converting is the pet bottles into fiber and that is creating a jeans and that has a higher affinity for the customers because they feel that they are you know doing good to the environment by consuming it now these are early trends but definitely it is also uh, you know pushing sales for a lot of companies where they are showing esg compliance how is the um, you know india's overall clean energy sector looking to you it's already pretty hot in 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 terms of attracting foreign capital foreign hmm. investment so is there anything that can change it and make it more exciting that's the first one and the second is that what is the overall universe of such stocks in india so sector level stock level you know probably listed unlisted hmm. whatever it is sir so if you look at the overall uh, basket of uh, you know investments that are coming uh, in in india and surprisingly you know one of the largest uh, you can say esg compliant uh, uh, you can say uh, group is from india which is the tata group and uh, if you look at investments in solar for example it's roughly around 200 to 300 billion dollars of investment that will come in the coming 5 7 years and also in the ev space a similar amount is expected to convert our vehicles into uh, ev 
and if you look at even biofuel so the fuel consumption that is happening the government also wants it to be blended with ethanol so the current blending which was you know maybe just 4 5% in 2014 has gone up to almost 11% last year and is expected to go to almost 20% the government is planning by 2025 so if you think about solar wind biofuels electric vehicles hydrogen these are the pockets of investments which we feel would attract a lot of capital and if you look at the winners in the stock markets also in the past one year for example a company called uh, you know uh, uh, borosil renewables which is making solar glass it is now become one of the largest you know facility uh, outside of china in the world and is you know almost doing its uh, capacity growing its capacity by 10x it was making just 180 tons a day 2 uh, years ago and by 2024 it will have almost 2000 tons a day capacity so that company's market cap from just 1200 crores when we wrote a first report on it is now around 8000 crores and a lot more uh, mutual funds and a lot more investment banks are chasing it for giving it the growth capital that it wants if you look at a company called sangvi movers which is into providing cranes for setting up wind farms their complete capacity is booked out after 8 years so 8 years they were having surplus cranes and this year every crane is on ground and deployed and they are now ordering more cranes from germany so that they can maybe install more uh, wind farms if you look at a company called mtar which is supplying you know hydrogen uh, boxes and supplying a lot of equipment to you know bloom energy in the us so there's an export opportunity which is you know coming up via companies like mtar and it just did an ipo a couple of years ago and again is being uh, you know given a very high valuation in the market because of the business that it is doing also a company called praj industries which is in fact the leader in asia in in fact the whole world in making uh, these ethanol plants it's the largest engineering company in the world and if you look at the company had uh, you know almost 9 years where it did nothing and uh, the market cap has gone up by 6 times in the past 2 years alone because the government's uh, you know impetus or or complete focus on you know uh, getting the blending target to the 20% that it has decided so these are the kind of opportunities which have come up and uh, that has uh, you know even benefited the investors who identified these trends and invested in unlisted space we did an investment in a company called navitas alpha which is manufacturing you know solar film so as you think about a solar panel which has glass on the upper side it has a thin layer of film which is attached to the solar cell so that it is protected mm. and the cell doesn't get uh, you know uh, uh, destroyed or the cell gets the adequate amount of uv rays and also it protects the cell from the external environment if the glass breaks right so that again there were only four companies in india which were making these f- films and 90% of the films were being imported from china from that now we are moving towards almost 80% of the films being manufactured in india in the coming 2 years so these are throwing opportunities in, in terms of listed and unlisted both worlds and we are very excited about uh, india's future in this because we are the only country outside of china which is giving this hope to the world that we will also be a very big material supplier for solar glass solar film even panels for that matter wind farms uh, wind turbines and uh, green hydrogen any concern on the high level of indebtedness in some of these companies there is and in fact if you look at the biggest amount of wealth destruction has happened in the so called environmentally uh, you know uh, faced companies if you look at a company called suzlon for example or mozabair these were the two largest companies which were there uh, you know focusing on solar and wind for the past decade and they went bust but this has happened in any sector which is emerging if you look at the tech bubble of 2000 that happened because the initial round of companies didn't know how to make cash flows and every dot com company went bust around the year 2000 and there were only few survivors hmm. but the companies which survived like an amazon or a facebook they made almost 100x or 200x returns in the coming two decades so similarly if you look at in the 
space of green energy in the space of hydrogen in the space of all these esg compliant companies there have been accidents in the past and this has given a lot of entrepreneurs this uh, understanding that if you they don't focus on cash flows and they just keep on dreaming about these concepts at the high level this is not going to work and that is where surprisingly we've had you know successes like a borosil renewable even now reliance talking about and the investment by reliance is very important over here because if you think from the perspective what reliance has done over the past 3 decades they've always gone into any sector when they feel that all disruptions have happened right mm. for example in telecom when people were disrupting themselves that is when it entered and it completely captured the market and now we are seeing jio as a huge success and almost like a monopoly in the data world right so reliance is entry proves a point that you know they feel that the sector is now mature and they always go after mature sectors they don't invest in sectors till they feel their uh, you know technological maturity has not arrived so very important things have happened in the past two decades where technological uh, maturity also scale of operations also the gl- global focus has made companies more cash flow positive and when companies become cash flow positives then the chances of their uh, you know going down goes uh, uh, reduces by a lot okay arvin let's talk about the policy side large amount of government revenues come from the older you know the Correct. fossil fuel sectors so how does policy need to be thought of now to figure out what's good for the planet yeah. is also good for the economy so that's the dichotomy as a policy maker because if you think about in the longer term what you need to do would completely you know throw your finances out of the window because mo- almost 30% of revenues at the central level come from these uh, you know fuels which are traditionally or 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 the fossil fuel economy and that is a big blow to the government exchequer if we think about that but in the longer run if the government is able to manage the ship well i mean it it cannot over invest in the short term and then face the revenue loss and then need to you know go to the foreigners to uh, uh, you know borrow more money if it plans it properly there can be a lot of savings too so if you look at the coal imports in our country and the fossil fuel imports that are happening we can save on them in a in a very big way and that can go to fund these projects and if uh, government plans it uh, uh, you know uh, in a good way a lot of foreign funds in fact look at the india market and they want to bring the capital investment over here so that we can be a net net provider of these things to the world hmm. so that investment can make the exchequer also richer uh, by uh, by by maybe few billion dollars but then that has to be managed well if that is not managed well there have been again accidents in the world where countries have faced the, the trouble because of being early into the game yeah let's talk about some global trends uh, arvin when it comes to esg for example <laughs> one so one conversation that's happening globally is is it a fad or a shift <laughs> lot of funds are being launched lot of assets are moving mm-hmm. and then you've got you know large asset managers like blackrock uh, asking listed companies to work on their esg go larry fink apparently wrote this letter mm-hmm. sec has also asked funds to <laughs> not mislead on esg what's happening globally what do you think so globally there are uh, you know there are lot of things which in a way uh, are are shaping uh, you know uh, Uh, points which we should uh, consider in terms of uh, you know how esg should be thought of because till now there is no global uh, standard which makes uh, esg as a measurable uh, you can say index or uh, there are no standard formats which people can maybe assign and then try to figure out whether a company is esg compliant or not larry fink very famously has said that the next 100 you know unicorns are going to be companies which will be into the green energy space and that's where you know if you think about uh, what is happening is a lot of companies are also using this for their advantage in terms of defrauding their investors or you know maybe greenwashing a lot of things where they are saying it's esg but they are not complying any standards they are just using their uh, firepower to make uh, the agencies report their esg scores and things like that so a lot of things need to be sorted in terms of you know actual uh, uh, scoring of these matrices and if that is done properly which should happen and anything when it starts mm. it has these teething issues and which we are going through in the world but it's definitely not a fact. bad because if you think that globally 
uh, it has become almost impossible to fund a non esg project at this point of time that is the large mandate that most of the investment banks most of the you know even uh, you know uh, governments and the government banks have had around the world so uh, that it it's a ball that has been sent to a momentum and i don't think there's a going back that your economy would go back to the old uh, school measures if there are uh, you know some issues in midway they'll for try to figure those issues and solve them and there are a lot of issues that need to be solved and as in when the world is realizing them there are issues, there are things that have been suggested and uh, there are pragmatic approaches towards them and large money when it gets committed to a particular theme generally we've seen eventually that theme wins so if it was you know uh, the, the connectivity around the world or the internet uh, of things around the world though there were several bankruptcies it was unthinkable in the year 2000 that we'll come over here to the kind of uh, you know front page uh, news that were going around but we are here right uh, the world is more connected uh, a lot of things uh, the internet is uh, you know driving and that is where we feel that all these teething issues would also have their answer and the fad would not uh, i mean materialize uh, longer term so come you know talking about longer term what are the implications of renewable energy now being cheaper than conventional traditional fossil fuel based power capacity mm. oh, you know what happens to the competition and how is this shape i mean how is this going to shape out so i don't believe that you know you can have a world view which uh, you can you know force on everyone just, just because solar is cheap you should have solar everywhere because it depends from geography to geography is also depends from the point of view of the resources that are available i am not of a big fan of people who are saying that everyone everything needs to go to solar or everything needs to go to wind or hydrogen because you would have to have a mix of these resources for a long period of time and then only you can make a shift which is more sustainable if you look around what is happening to the grids around the world they are collapsing if they are being injected by more solar or wind because it's an unsustainable power right a grid infrastructure needs to get uh, modernized by a large extent till we are uh, you know producing 100% of renewable energy so i don't think that uh, just cost is of of matter over here even stability to the grid the quality of the power that is getting manufactured is very very important and that will have a lot of uh, you know thermal energy still uh, being dominant in a lot of geographies and it will only come down gradually there cannot be a complete shift is what i think cost maybe can be a driver of profitability in the short term but in the longer term the mix of the grid would be far more important yeah so wrapping up this uh, episode arvind let's talk about you know things that affect the listener the investor directly for mm-hmm. example um when it comes to green energy or let's talk about esg as a whole um what are the major sectors that will benefit india and any company that you think are actually leading this transition correct so if you think from the sectoral point of view you look at what is happening in germany right now where it was completely dependent on external source of energy and every sector right now is in doldrums right if you look at german chemical sector the uh, machinery engineering every sector which german w- germans were known for currently is now you know the business is shifting to either india china or all these countries because they are facing a severe shortage of gas so if energy mix is proper every sector in the economy benefits because most of the sectors are energy in- intensive you think about building materials you think about steel the basic materials you think about any sector and if if at all india can get its energy mix right we can be the next manufacturing superpower of the world easily because china subsidized it pa- its power for so many years and that's where it got the benefit of cheap power cheap you know money that the government gave and cheap labor but now china doesn't have all those advantages right we as a country have made a very important step in the right direction when it comes to our energy mix and that is why our energy costs surprisingly are one of the lowest in the world and in a scenario where governments around the world are facing with blackouts i think we had very small or very few issues in few uh, you know states barring that 
India did very well in in this turbulent phase. So most of the sectors benefit, and it 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 in a way gives a competitive advantage for products to be manufactured in India. If you look at groups' perspective, Tata are by far the best groups for the ESG compliance. In fact, they are just not number one in India; they're number one in Asia for that matter in the rankings, and followed by Mahindra's and. ITC. So, if you look about I- ITC, you will see a cigarette company. How it, it's ESG, but it's manufacturing practices, it's employee, uh, you know, uh, environment around its communities, also the rural areas that they are serving. They are doing a lot of things which are net net ESG positive. And finally, for our listeners and people who are getting started in planning their ESG investments, what do you think are the major factors that they should consider? So. a lot of esg scores are available i but i'd say these esg scores are very nascent and how they are structured is still you know very perplexing because you will find a lot of companies which are esg compliant and if you look at it, it the score just is throwing a number which doesn't mean anything because when you go towards the working of the company there will be a lot of things that you feel that these are not esg compliant still the scores are high because of certain matrices right so though the scores are emerging you should not rely completely on the score but you just think about if if a company is you know environmentally uh, you know doing things for maybe deforestation or the company is maybe you know also planning something to increase the yield of uh, maybe uh, uh, the the crops that are being produced nearby the community whether they they are doing things for reducing the pollution of uh, you know the water uh, treatment plants they are putting whether they are putting flue gas desulfurization units which will you know reduce the air pollution around so all these investments would in a way increase their expenses in the short run right and hence you'd say that the profitability is less but if they don't do it it would some, something would bite them in the future either the government would slap a pollution control board notice or the communities around would complain so yes these are things which will paint a negative picture on the pnl side but you should definitely look at for example governance right uh, or uh, for that matter even the social impact if if the social environment is good then more and more talent would uh, come and you know uh, join those companies so what they are doing for their clients uh, their their uh, you know their employees even the communities around even for you know uh, the various stakeholders that is very very important whether on the governance part i are they lobbying a lot are they you know uh, politically connected uh, or they are using their power to you know uh, twist around policy making also the board composition whether they have a audit committee which is proper or not so all these things are nitty gritties which uh, currently you have to go to the annual report hmm. and also do some due diligence yourself but in the future definitely we believe there will be reliable indicators which would uh, make the job easy for an investor So folks if you want to know more about ESG about green energy do check out the green energy small case which is a portfolio of stocks that will benefit from the renewable energy sector developments and that you can track and invest in with your favorite brokerage account links in the episode description and in the show notes that's a wrap on this episode of the ideas project hope you enjoyed this really deep insightful chat with arvin kothari and hope this helps you understand esg and green energy markets a little better arvin thank you so much for joining us thank you so much for and inviting and sharing your insights with our listeners thank you thank you for inviting me and folks if you like this episode do consider subscribing to the podcast and leaving us a review on apple podcast and google podcasts this podcast is powered by small case we will come back with more insightful conversations to help you achieve a well-rounded investment portfolio until then bye bye see you in the next episode of the ideas project